set of links and tie one of those bases? Well, I think it's probably uh, or maybe for something like that could be eight minutes. Because you're, you're, you're not seeing that thing, right? You're seeing very slow movement you know, back and forth. The neat thing about Bell Atlantic, as I said before, because it's so narrow in one direction and uh, flat in the other, uh, one time it was in the middle of January, for some reason, the wind came directly out of the south. We're always worried about the wind coming out of the northwest visiting the face of the building, but the wind came out of the south from the airport up 19th Street. As it came up 19th Street, it was somewhat sheltered by the buildings that are uh, to the south on uh, Market. And so the wind came and it really hit the building right on the shoulder. And instead of getting this, we started to get this. We started to get to torsional rotation, right? If I was standing in the core of the building, the center of the core right in the middle, I wouldn't feel anything, right? But out of the edge where somebody on the top floor just drinking this cup of coffee and putting it down and noticing that there's little wavelets in the cup, right? Not feeling too comfortable. That out there, that was where things were, were, were kind of getting to a point where you could actually uh, register the building movement relative to uh, a landmark out in the horizon and know that the building was, or the horizon was moving or the building was moving. I saw the building was moving, which is right. Actually, we had some doors on a little bit. That was the one day we had, and the building is rather limber. It doesn't have a concrete encasement on it. It's a steel building all the way. So waves are important. The addition and subtraction of waves is something you should know. That if you had a, a wave that was a step function, for some reason, I'm thinking you're going to use some binary electricity. But for me, if you're going to come along and uh, be an intensive major or come study in the graduate program, we're going to be dealing with uh, bending moment diagrams and shear diagrams, which are somewhat like waves. But you should be aware that if you have a wave that does this, and we superimpose on that a wave, right, this is zero, so this is plus one, and this may be minus two. If I had a wave that was zero and then uh, went up to plus one and over, down, and out, right, I can combine those waves rapidly. And I guess the other key thing I'd like to mention is, and I said this last time, physics is not necessarily a language of mathematics. It can be, there are ways that we, and I know if you're sitting here and you're taking physics for architects, you've got brains that collage things together. You're not slicers. You're not, let me get to A, let me get to B, let me get to C, let me get to D. You're saying, hey, wait, is A, B, C, D? What if I combine them together like this? What do I get for result? You do very well with a lot of variables that are in front of you, as long as you get some basic control to organize and integrate spaces and, and compositions. Right? That's the way your mind works. There's nothing that says you can't take that skill and apply it to the world of physics. So if you're com not comfortable with an equation, an equation is nothing more than a, a cloud of sentence. Right? F equals N A. Right? So here, do graphs and start to add things together. So adding, you know, taking a piece of paper and saying, well, gee, if this is one, and I'm adding to nothing, then the result must be one. So your combined graph is going to be one. And if this is a plus one and that's a minus two, Minus two from plus one, you can do it with little pieces of paper, right? That, take away that, you're left with a one here. And I have a zero here and a zero here, it must be zero. Just think that you can use graphs, you can use your, your visual skills to be able to go through and see things. Your powers of observation far transcend anybody that's an engineer who's halfway sort of between a physicist and an architect. Um, remember now, sound, waves, light, Ways we'll talk about this in a little bit later on. I want to get to fluids because fluids is, a, is somewhat, in, for an architect, is somewhat mysterious because when I say fluids, you think of water or you think of some kind of a rushing stream. But remember now, air, gases are liquids as well as, as the, uh, the water. And in your building, you're going to design, you have a tremendous amount of fluid dynamics that are at play. You have to move a tremendous amount of air into ventilate, you've got to get that air out, that air's got to be conditioned. And the way that it all functions in building is, uh, is something that uh, you'll look in terms of the intensity of how that is moving along. I think, do you do a Bernoulli equation? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So you know, obviously for plumbing systems, you're going to have it, but you've you got to be aware that nowadays, because of energy concerns, that there's a tremendous amount of spotlight on the world of keeping buildings conditioned, but not expending energy to do it. And I'm sure your careers are going to be really <coughs> formed around, around that. For the most part, and if you look at my build, my I'm a partner of a very large firm in town that has architects and engineers. And right now, if you went on to the top floor, you'd see that the 
architects and uh, structural engineers sit in the same space. There's something about the two disciplines, making space and carbon space. But I have a feeling by the time you, know, you get into the middle part of your career that the mechanical part of this thing, the air moving part of this thing, is going to become an integral part of making the buildings. It's going to have a lot to do with the way it's shaped, the way it's formed. I have a brother-in-law who is uh, now today up in uh, far reaches in Maine, and he's making money hand over fist by doing custom woodwork. And he gets all of his files digitally that come into his shop. Right? He sets them up. He has about a million dollars worth of these sophisticated routers that can do six degrees of freedom and he can create any shape out of the thing. So the point I'm making is that I'm seeing in the profession that we're moving much more to customization than we are to standard, standardize, standardized parts any longer. So you'll start to be able to craft your spaces in a way that you're going to react in a, in a real fashion, more economically, to one that's made out of digital um, information. And I use the example that you know if you're buying jeans right now, you know you're paying for them, you know at uh, 100 plus a clip to pick them. If you had a choice of getting a gene that was based upon and designed exactly to a body scan, right, that's going to fit you perfectly and cost you less, we're going to do that keystroke in a minute, right? And I think that's where with the whole profession of architecture and design is going right now. We're going to be doing things that respond directly to the situation we have in front of us. Whether robotics is going to be there, maybe three quarters into your career, that we can actually create a digital file through robotics and actually have the thing built in on how you and the touch the thing. I think it's coming. Little flash note here, plumbing, electricity, the same. Plumbing and electricity. So if you can understand, you know, the electrical circuits, or maybe easier if you can understand plumbing, you, can, you know how to do all of the, the world of electricity. I'll leave that up to you. You nodded it, so you can, you know, but uh, there's tremendous affinities between the two. And actually, nowadays, which, uh, from a system standpoint, we're seeing actually structures as being pulled into that. For a high-rise building right now, if you look at the building and try to understand what's making it work and perform and stand up, you've got to go to school to understand it. When buildings were four stories, two stories tall, where gravity was the major component in terms of shaping the spaces in the buildings, right? arches and all that stuff, right? you could kind of look at the thing with some basic notion of how forces were flowing, you could understand why the building was shaped and why things were made the way they were. But nowadays, because of the sophistication of dealing with not just the strength, which to me is a gravity aspect of it, but that stitches thing we talked about before, that's a, a key factor that's, uh, that's uh, accompanied on shaping things. Hydrostatic pressure. We, I, most, I was doing a building in Saudi Arabia, and people came on to talk about Saudi Arabia. You know, we, dealt with hydrostatic pressure. Water, as you know, if you dive into a pool, your ears feel the, the pressure. The deeper, deeper you go in, you know, go, dive in the diving board and try to, you know, catch that thing that's down 10 feet in at the bottom of the pool, and you can feel the pressure. The thing you have to remember is that the pressure is working all directions, all directions, right? It's not north, south, east, west, it's all directions. 